Today's message title is Faith to Overcome Problems. Faith to Overcome Problems. Who's ever had a problem? If I were to do a poll today and said, if you've ever had a problem in your life, you would probably raise your hand. And if you don't raise your hand, you have a problem. But everybody has problems, and the goal of the message today is to provide you with some revelatory insight that you can use to help you solve problems in a victorious way. Everybody say a victorious way. Because you can solve problems and not be, do it victoriously. I mean, if someone tries to run you over in the road, you can solve that problem by shooting them, but that's not victorious, amen? So before I start, I'm going to do something I've never done before. Just look at your neighbor and say, this is new for him. I'm going to tell you that I'm about to do something. I am going to actually receive an offering at the end of service. I'm telling you that on the front end so that you can not just prepare yourself, but, but I, I, wanted, I wanted you to know in advance because I believe the teaching today needs to be activated by your faith with the seed. And, and don't worry about it, because so many people be like, well, how much is he going to ask for? I'm not going to ask for an amount. Amen. I'm going to let God do what he needs to do in your heart to sow whatever you need to sow. And here's the thing. I believe a lot of times most believers never get or see a God-ordained harvest because they always sow a man-proclaimed seed. Touch your neighbor and say, he's preaching already, he's preaching already. I'm going to say that again because I don't think you got it. Let me rewind that. Most people never see a God-ordained harvest because they always sow a man-proclaimed seed. See, a lot of times we wait for someone to, uh, to tell us to do something instead of listening to what God wants us to do. And do you know that God will sometimes instruct you to do something that you don't want to do? 17 years ago, I was sitting somewhere back over in there. I was at my first pastor's conference here at New Light. And uh, I was being spiritual in my hotel room, ironing my shirt. And I asked God a question. And let me encourage you, if you don't want to know what God wants to say, don't ask him. I'm ironing my shirt felt real spiritual. I said, God, what would you like for me to give on behalf of Word of Truth Family Church as the pastor in the offering because I knew they would do an offering. And the Lord clearly, everybody say clearly. clearly. He clearly spoke to me and said, I want you to give $5,000 tonight. I said, I won't be doing that. <laughs> he clearly told me to give $5,000. I clearly told him I won't be doing that. So I showed up for service. It's time for the offering. And they were doing offerings, you know, where it was a public giving. I grew up Presbyterian. I had never seen that, but I knew it was biblical. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm involved too. So I write out a check for $2,500. And I march down here as a cheerful giver. And I screamed the amount, $2,500. And everybody was like, wow, that was kind of loud. And, and I went back to my seat. And I thought I did something. And I sat down and it was only three of us on staff because my church was only six months old. This was my first time. $5,000, that's a lot of money. So this one staff member looks at me and says, Pastor, I believe we're supposed to give another $2,500. I wanted to say the devil is a lie. But I couldn't say it because I knew that was God. He didn't know what God had told me. So I reluctantly, I felt like, you know, the rich young ruler. I was sad at that saying. <laughs> and I know God loves a cheerful giver, but he don't hate an uncheerful one. I uncheerfully came down here and gave another $2,500. On my way to the sea, the Spirit of God says to me, Eben, I want you to give your gold Rolex watch off your wrist. Put it in the offering. God is stripping me on my first pastor's conference. So I sat down and I had a sad face and one of my, my, my staff members said, Pastor, what's wrong? I said, God just told me to give my Rolex in the offering. So I took out my handkerchief and I started shining it. And they was like, what are you doing? I said, I'm giving my watch a proper burial. 
outside of my house and car, that was my most prized possession. Came down here, I gave it, went back there, and I was mad the whole service. But watch this though. What I did not know, because see, now I have insight 17 years later. I did not know what God was going to use that seed for my church and that seed for me personally to us never have a need in 17 years in our church. There was an occasion on one situation that I'm going to tell you about at the end. So, we're going to be talking about faith to overcome problems. Look at your neighbor and say, you need some faith. And problems are something that we all are going to experience. It doesn't matter what your economic status is. It doesn't matter what your education level is. It doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. At the end of the day, we will all experience problems in this, in this life. Say amen to that. Now, Jesus said something that we're going to look at today to help us know this, but he also gives us a key on overcoming these problems. So we're going to look at John chapter 16, verse 33. So if you have your Bibles, you can do that or you can follow on the screen. I'm reading this out of the New King James Version. And if you're at home, I want you to either follow the verses on the screen or you can pull out your own Bibles. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, Jesus said, these things have I spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In this world, everybody say in this world. Now the Bible tells us we're in this world, but we're not of this world. He said in this world, you will have tribulation. Everybody say, that's a promise. He says in this world, you're going to have some problems. He says, but be of good cheer. Watch this now. He says, I have overcome. And that word overcome means conquered. I have conquered the world. So if you're taking notes, point number one in our lesson today is you and I, we must have the proper perspective of problems. Amen. We must have the proper perspective of problems. In John 16, 33, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Everybody say, that's a promise. Now, what Jesus is saying is, as long as we are living on this side of life, as long as we are in the earth realm, as long as we're alive, we're going to have some problems. So listen, it is unrealistic. Touch your neighbor and say, this is unrealistic. It is unrealistic to think you will reach a point in your life where you will never have any more problems. Sometimes I think that's what we strive to do. As believers, I think we feel like if I had enough money or if I got this or I got that, I won't have any problems anymore. No, Jesus guaranteed he made us a promise you're going to always have some problems. But the beautiful thing is he gave us the right perspective that we should have. He said, be of good cheer or don't get down, don't get discouraged, don't be disappointed about that. Why? Watch this. He said, because I've already done something about that. How many here have bills? Let me see your hand. You have bills? All right. Uh, how many said, Pastor Evan, boy, I tell you what, I came here and I was, you know, I needed some gas when I got here. And you told me it took $100 to, to gas your car. And I told you, okay, I'm going to give you the $100. Your need has already been met according to my riches and glory. Because I would give you the $100. Jesus is saying, I have already overcome it. In other words, it's already done. He said, be of good cheer. I've overcome, I've conquered the world. Everybody say, that's a promise. So even though he told us we would have problems in life, on the other hand, he said, don't worry about that. In fact, he says, I want you to have a good attitude about it. I want you to be of good cheer. Why? Just like I promised you the gas money, he says, I'm promising you that I've already dealt with the problem before you experience it. In other words, I have fixed something for you before it happens to you. He's saying I have solved a problem even before you experience it. And see, that's why now we can have the proper perspective. Because it doesn't matter what comes my way, he's already promised me he's going to fix it. In fact, he's already fixed it. And the only way to have the proper perspective of problems, watch this now, is to see it from Jesus' perspective. So we must change our perspective from a natural perspective to a spiritual perspective. Well, what's the spiritual perspective? Well, here's a take-home statement that I want you to write down. In fact, I want you to think about this this week. Everybody say, hmm. Here's a take-home statement. When God makes you a promise, Jesus made us one. He said, listen, 
I have overcome the world, meaning I have taken care of the problems that you're going to experience. Here's the take-home statement. When God makes you a promise, it's already done by the time he tells you. I'm going to say that again. When God makes you a promise, it's already done before he tells us. Jesus made us a promise. You're going to have some problems, but it's already done because he said, I've already conquered it. God told Elijah in 1 Kings 17, they're going to put it on the screen, verses 2, God made Elijah a promise. He says, the word came to him, and then verse 3, he told him, I want you to go east and hide yourself at the brook, and then verse 4, he makes a promise. He says, and it shall be when you drink of the brook, he says, I have commanded. In other words, he says, listen, I've already communicated with some birds on your behalf. He says, I have commanded the ravens to feed you. In other words, everybody say, when God makes you a promise, it's already done by the time he tells you. God then decided, okay, the brook dried up because sometimes in life, the very job you prayed for, changes took place and it's time to move. The problem with us is, we adjust our mentalities to little. Instead of the brook dried up, instead of him sitting up there drinking mud, the same God that told him to go to the brook is now providing him with new instructions. And so sometimes we get so comfortable, that's three words, comfortable with what we are and where we're going, and because God gave me the job, now it's time for you to maybe move on. And so God told Elijah, I want you to now change locations because this brook has dried up. So in 1 Kings 17, verse 9, he told him, he says, Arise, I want you to go to Zarephath, and I want you to dwell there. And then watch the promise. He says, I have commanded a widow woman to feed you. Everybody say, that's a promise. See, when God makes you a promise, it's already done by the time he tells you. In Matthew 17, 27, we see the same principle. Jesus and Peter ran into an unplanned problem. You ever had an unplanned problem? That's a problem that, that's a bill that came in the mail that you didn't expect. Come on, that's a doctor's report that they gave you that you did not anticipate. Amen. That's, that's an activity on, the, on behalf of one of your children that something happened at school and now you, it, it's costing you some money. They ran into an unplanned problem, and I say it's unplanned because they needed to pay some taxes, and here's the thing, Judas, the treasurer, wasn't there. That's who carried the money. So now the New Living Translation of Matthew 17, 27 says this, because they were talking about needing to pay the taxes, Jesus says, however, we don't want to offend them, so go down to the lake, throw in a line, open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Watch this, church. He says, take it, pay the tax for both of us. Then let me just throw this in for free. You don't have enough until you can meet your need and then also meet the need of, of somebody else. See, Christians, believers, we get to the point where we just want to have enough. I want to have enough for me, myself, and I. Maybe shop a little bit and have a little bit left over. The problem is, anytime you have just enough, listen, what's going to happen is if someone needs something, if you give them some, you are now in the not enough category. So most of us spend our time believing God for just enough when he wants us to not just be blessed, but to... Oh, y'all know the same God I know. Praise the Lord for that. And here's the perspective, the perspective I want us to have this morning. When problems come our way, we need to have a spiritual perspective. Say spiritual perspective. We need to have a spiritual perspective because watch this. Jesus gave us a spiritual promise that has been made. And this spiritual promise, watch this, will solve the natural problems that life has made for us. The provision of Jesus' promise that he's already overcome the world, watch this, has already released the supply for my problem. So I want you to see, because there are going to be times where you're going to need a supply of problem solving. God will give you some wisdom. I'm going to show you some keys here in just a second. But see, most of us, we think money alone will solve our problems, and it won't. Because people with lots of money still have problems. But here's what I discovered. Ask me what I've discovered. 
I've discovered that sometimes in life we create our own problems, which leads us to point number two. Here's point number two if you're taking notes. All problems, everybody say all problems. All problems work together for our good. Not just life-made problems, not just man-made problems, but even self-made problems can work together for our good. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, a very familiar passage of Scripture. I want to show you something about this verse. Romans chapter 8, let's start now in verse 28. What's the first word in that verse, church? Huh? What is it? Romans 8, 28. What's the first word in the verse? And. Come on, church. And. What is it? And. and. Now, when I was growing up, I'm a little, you know, I, I'm, look old, I, I'm older than what I look like. But we used to have this cartoon on Saturdays that, that, that it was educational. And it used to be a song that says, conjunction, junction. Oh, y'all know it. Oh, y'all old as dirt. That's why y'all know that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And it's a conjunction. So I don't want to keep reading. It says, and we know that all things work together. Well, because it starts with and, that means it's connected to the previous verse. So now we're not going to read verse 28 yet. We're going to go down to verse 27. Let's look at verse 27. What's the first word in that verse, church? Oh, and, well, okay, well, we can't keep reading that verse because that verse 27 is connected to verse 26. So let's read verse 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities or weaknesses. It says, for we know not what we should pray for as we should, but the Spirit itself, he makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because he, the Spirit, makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know all things work together for good. How do we know all things work together for good? Because I'm praying in the Spirit and the Spirit is making intercession for me, and he is praying the will of God for my life. So I know that all things can work together for good to them that love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. Sometimes when we are the cause of our own problems, we tend to not have faith to approach God to help us. We think like the world sometimes. You know how the world say silly stuff like, well, I got myself in it. I got to get myself out. Look at your neighbor and say, that's crazy. When you have a spiritual perspective, because that's the point. When we have a spiritual perspective of our problems, then you'll understand that God is in the problem with you. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge. He's our strength. Listen, he's a very present help in the trouble. So if he's in me, and I'm in trouble, he's in the trouble with me. So regardless of the problem, you and I can count on God's help even if it's our fault. So let me just give you insight to that Romans verse. All things will work together for your good even if it's your fault. I'm going to say that again because see, look, some of y'all going, really? Look, I'm going to say it again. All things can work together for good even if it's your fault. Everybody say years ago. Years ago, uh, I was faithful at a church. I wasn't pastoring. And uh, I was one of those faithful people. They gave me keys to the church. So we were having like a two or three day revival type thing. And uh, I was closing down the church, making sure it was ready for the next night. Making sure the air conditioned timing was straight. Making sure the trash was, you know, together. Make sure all the lights was out. And so while I'm preparing the church building for the next day, I got an unction to pray in the spirit. I didn't have a reason. I didn't know a reason. I didn't see a reason. But I just obeyed the unction. And so I started praying in the spirit just like we just read. And as I'm praying, I'm just praying and moving. So I go to lock the, you know, I put the alarm on and then I, locked the, the door and I took the trash with me and uh, the trash was big so I didn't want to tote it to the dumpster. So I put the trash bag on top of my hood and drove the car to the dumpster. 
Make sense? Now, I had two sets of keys, and I had the kind of key ring where you could separate them. So I got to the dumpster, and I had both sets of keys in my hand. Well, to pick up the trash bag, I, want, I put one set of keys on top of the car. And I put the trash in the dumpster and completely forgot about the keys on the, tr on the hood, uh, on the uh, top of the roof. I forgot about it. So now I leave, and I'm driving, and I get on the highway, and I hear this scratch noise come off the hood, or the, the, the roof, just And I looked up in my rear view. I didn't see nothing. I thought, wow, that was weird. Didn't think nothing of it. I'm still praying in tongues, though. I don't know why, but I'm praying. I knew why I was praying when I got home. Because I didn't have no keys to get in. I was like, hot dog, that's what that sound was. So now, I, look, you know, you can pray and then you can pray. So I went from going, to I mean, I, look, I was all in at that point. I know why I was praying. I done lost my keys on the highway. So I turn around and I go and, and, and I start get back on the highway to figure, you know, it's about, I don't know, 12, 30 in the morning now. And, and, I'm, and I'm looking for my, high, my keys on the highway. How many know that's crazy? Don't know what lane it's in. It's a four or five lane highway. And after doing that two times, I was like, forget it. I'm just going to get all the keys made, remade on that keychain. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, no. I want you to follow me this time. He said, loop back around. So I looped back around, came back around, and got back on the same highway. He says, now just go at regular speed. And then he says, now I want you to slow down. He said, now go all the way and get on the medium. And so I'm on the medium. He says, now slow down, slow down. And then he says, stop. I stop. He says, cut your headlights or your high beams on. And he says, and get out and go look at the front of the car. I get out and look at the front of the car, and guess what my lights were shining on? Doggone it on my keys. When you engage the Spirit of God in your life, he will help you solve any problem you will experience. And I want you to know, there is no problem you are going to face or facing now that God don't already have a solution for Say amen to that. Amen. Everybody say, God, when God makes you a promise, God. it's already done when he tells you. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? So we can obtain mercy and find, watch this, grace to help when you need it. So in order for us to use our faith to overcome problems, I'm reviewing. The first thing I told you is that we have to have the proper perspective of a problem. In other words, there is no, listen, this is the proper perspective. Guess what? There is no problem I will ever experience that don't already have a solution to it. You say, well, Pastor Evan, I went to the doctor and they found something that they don't even have a name for it. So what? I have a name for it. It's called, by his stripes you are healed. So we have to have the proper perspective of problems. Here's number two. All problems work together for our what? For our good, which leads us to our third point. So if you're taking notes, here's point number three. This is so good. Consistent sowing positions me for consistent answers. Woo. I'm going to say that again. Consistent sowing positions me for consistent answers. Unfortunately, many Christians have bought the lie from the world that giving is a preacher thing. It's a church thing when it's really a God thing. In fact, I'm just going to park here for just a second. I know there's all this controversy. Oh, it's tithe is still good. Well, my question is, is thou shalt not kill still good? Do you know it's really not even about that? It's bigger than that. Tithing is just, it, it just exposes your heart. Because the first time the first was given was not even by Abraham. You go back to Genesis and the Bible says that uh, uh, Abel and Cain showed up and evidently God told both of them what to give him because if he hadn't, he couldn't hold them accountable. And the Bible says Cain just gave an offering, but Abel gave of the first fruit, watch this, and some fat. That's called tithe and offering. And Cain got mad because the Bible says God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain and his offering. Oh, so you mean to tell me 
God rejected what Abel gave. See, a lot of times we come to church and what we're giving is being rejected. You know, listen, it's being rejected by God, but it's being accepted by the church. Praise the Lord. But here's the thing. We walk away with the mindset. We can give God what we want to. No, no, God made it clear. So don't let the world deceive you with that foolishness. Say amen to that. We have limited, listen church, we have limited the harvest when we give to just material things. But let's go to Malachi 3.8. I just want to make something clear because this happened to me. Malachi 3.8. It says, bring all the tithe, where church? Into the storehouse. Why? That there may be meat in my house. Notice God has meat in his house or wants me. And then he says, and prove me now, here we says the Lord, if I will not open for you, watch this, the what? Win now, I want you to notice, it didn't say window. Amen. Amen. It says windows. So there's not this one big window in heaven that opens up for blessings to come out. No, there's a window over there. 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 Listen, there's enough windows for everybody's blessings to come out. He says, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven. And then watch this now. Here's the result of your giving and pour you out a blessing. So listen to this church. Answers for problems in life is a blessing. Do you agree? If you are having a problem and you get an answer for that problem, wouldn't you call that a blessing? Yeah. See, so blessings from your giving, according to Malachi 8, is not just money, blessing or material. It could be an answer. And there are so many examples in the Bible where people gave, watch this now, and it helped solve the problem in their life. First, Timothy, first Samuel chapter 9, verse 6 it says, and this is, let me just give you context. This was Saul. His dad had lost some donkeys. He sent Saul to go get them, him and his servant. And so now we pick up the story in verse 6. It says, and he said unto them, behold, now there is a, a, in the city a man of God. He's honorable. He's an honorable man. Dr. I is an honorable woman. And all that she says, he says, shall come to pass. He says, so now let us go. And perhaps maybe he can show us our way that we should go. In verse 7, then Saul said to the servant, Behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For our bread is spent in our vessels, and there's not a present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? In verse 8, the, the servant answered and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God. Watch this now to tell us our way. In other words, you know what? We're going to sow a seed, and sowing that seed, hopefully it's going to produce an answer that we need to solve our problem. Solomon, watch this. He lacked wisdom as a new king. And the Bible says he gave one time a thousand burnt offerings, and God showed up and said, what you need? He said, you know what? I don't know how to lead people. He says, I'm going to give you some wisdom ain't nobody ever had. In Luke chapter 5, verse 7, or verse 1, in his time of need, listen, Peter sowed a seed. Now, because I'm, I have an entrepreneurial background, when I read the Bible, I read it differently than a lot of people. See, we don't see Peter had a problem in this story. And because most people don't read the Bible with a real-life context perspective, it's hard for them to see the problem that Peter may have really had. He had fished all night and had caught nothing. Listen. Let me give you a different perspective. He had people working on his boat with him. Amen. Well, there are some people that get paid by the day. So now he owes some people some money, but he didn't catch no fish to pay them. Peter had a payroll shortage. Or maybe his mortgage was due. And he was expecting to pay his mortgage from the proceeds of the fish that he sold. But he didn't sell no fish. Now his house note might go into foreclosure. Listen, maybe some of the fish he was catching was for dinner that night. Look like somebody is going to be eating water sandwiches. Everybody say he had a problem. So let's read it real quick. Luke chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesis. 
and two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and they were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon Peter's, and he asked or prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and he talked to people out of the ship. In other words, Peter allowed Jesus to use his boat for free. He basically leased Jesus his boat and didn't give it an invoice. Verse 4. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a drop. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and we took nothing. He said, but nevertheless, at your word, we're going to let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a whole lot of fish. Peter experienced, watch this, a problem being solved by allowing Jesus to use his boat, which now takes me to our last principle today. And that is, we must follow the faith example of successful faith others if we're going to get some problems solved. See, there are some people that God has in your midst that they have the experience and the consistency of solving problems in a faith way. It's called New Light Church that all you have to do is follow them. Hebrews chapter six, verse 12 says, that you be not slothful, but followers of those, watch this church, who through faith and what else? And patience inherit the promises. See, I've been sowing into my pastor's life for years. And because I sow in his life, on a regular, everybody say on a regular. You know, you know when you regular, you regular. If you know what I'm saying. In fact, this year, I gave the biggest tithe I've ever given as a believer. I've been a believer 30-something years. And I gave the biggest one-time seed to my man of God. Amen. Everybody say, years ago. Yeah. Years ago, we just built a, a facility. 2016 is when we started. So it was 2018. We're almost finished. And uh, I, I like nice stuff. How many like nice stuff? Yeah. I like nice stuff. And uh, here it is. Uh, I'm like... Okay, they gave me the windows to pick, and so I picked these windows, and these windows uh, was the most expensive windows. I didn't check the price before I picked it. I picked it first. It's like going shopping, and you don't look at the receipt. You don't look at the label on your, you just, I want that. Well, that's what I did. So now it's time to pay the window lady. We had two loans at the time. One loan was finishing, and the next loan was supposed to, you know, start up when the, that one ended. But the bank had put some paperwork in that second loan that I didn't like. The wording in it wasn't good. So I checked with Apostle. He said, don't sign it yet. I checked with my attorney. They said, don't sign it yet. I checked with some other business uh, uh, people that, that mentor me. They said, don't sign it. And my spirit said, don't sign it yet. So my construction manager says, Pastor, the window lady said that if you don't pay her her money, she's going to sue you and put a lien on the church. I'm like, what? I said, call her and see if she'll meet with me. That was on a Thursday. We set up a meeting for me to meet with this lady on Friday. I owed this lady $187,000. I didn't know what I was going to do. I said, well, I'll just go to the meeting and just show her the paperwork from the loan and tell her the money's kind of there, but we ain't got it right now. I'm on my way there, and I'm riding, and I'm saying, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to tell this lady. I'm praying in tongues, too. And I said, Lord, I don't know what, I, what I'm going to do. And when I get to the location, the Holy Spirit says, tell this lady your pastor's story. Y'all going to know this story, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Years ago, when New Light wasn't really New Light all the way, it had just started up, and uh, uh, Apostle at the time was Pastor Hilliard. God told him to tell him, I'm going to bless you with a new car. Tell the church. He stands up in front of the church. Pastor's going to have a new car by next Sunday. And he knew that was going to be a miracle because his faith, his faith was intact, but his credit wasn't. Not at that time. And then the people knew it was going to have to be a miracle because, you know, their funds was in transition. So Monday rolls around, he goes, and he's going to all these banks, bank here, bank there, bank, 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 everybody, no, 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 no. Finally, he got discouraged, went back to the church, got on his knees, and he prayed. How many heard this story? How many heard this story? All right, some of y'all have them good. Just listen. 
I've heard this story I don't know how many times. I know, Apostle, you're watching me. I love you so much. <laughs> so he goes and prays, and the Lord said, well, you didn't ask me what bank to go to. He said, Lord, what bank? It was right down the street from the church. He goes into the bank, and what man just walks up to him and says, Preacher, what can I do for you today? How does a man know he's the preacher? He takes him to his office. He said, what can I do? Apostle says, I want a new car. He said, what kind of car do you want? He says, a Mercedes. He said, oh, one day, one day, you'll get a Mercedes. What's your, what's your second choice? See, because sometimes our desires are bigger than where our faith is at the point. He said, what's your second choice? He says, a Cadillac. You know, every preacher needs a Cadillac, right? He said, oh, one day, one day, you, you'll get a Cadillac. What's your third choice? He said, Buick Park Avenue. He says, perfect choice. The guy takes out his calculator. He starts calculating. He says, I can give you this much money for that car. Go find it. Didn't check his credit or nothing. He goes to the dealership, and, you know, when he drove up, they ain't coming to greet him because his car, they can barely see it from the smoke. <laughs> they called his car back in the day the bomb. He drives up and, Finally, he sees a car. He sits down with the sales manager. Sales manager says, okay, uh, you got some, how much money you got to put down? He says, uh, none. <laughs> How's your credit? Uh, it's not that good. But he says, but if you'll let me take that car home over the weekend, I'll bring you back the 10% you want me to put down on the car. The man says, we don't do business like that. And then this is what God told me to tell this lady that my pastor told this man. He says, sir, my banker has entrusted me for these many years to pay back that car. I need you to trust me for two or three days to bring you your money back. And he stuck his hand out there for the man to shake it. Amen. And the man looked at him like, oh no. But he shook his hand reluctantly and says, get this preacher's car ready. And long story short, it's a miracle. He got the car. He went to church. The church took up an offering and had enough for him to pay his insurance and have some gas money too. Right? So I'm sitting in this lady's office. And she was like, you know, Pastor, you, you created some cash flow problems for us. And, and, and she says, what do you want to do, preacher? And so I said what, what God told me to say. I said, ma'am, because our church was purchased with bonds. I said, ma'am, thousands of investors has entrusted Word of Truth Family Church to pay this seven and a half million dollar loan back in 25 years. I need you to trust me for six days to bring you your $187,000. And I stuck my hand out there like P Apostle did. <laughs> I mean, it worked for him. It's going to work for me. Follow those who through faith and patience receive the promise. I stuck my hand out there, and she just looked at me, and I was like, I ain't taking my hand out. If I got to do the robot, I'm going to do that, but I'm not going to take my hand out. She shook my hand, and then a boldness came on me. I call it a so he and boldness came on me and I said to her if I ain't got your money in six days you can do whatever you got to do to get that money and I walked out of there kind of almost like a George Jefferson walk like you know like I mean I was bold you would have thought I listen and then I got in the car I was like Lord where we gonna get this money bro where we gonna get this money Lord I didn't know where we was gonna get that money from that was on a Friday Saturday no money Sunday no money Monday, no money. Tuesday, no money. Now, I'm praising and I'm praying and I'm thinking and I'm declaring. Wednesday, no money yet. I have a construction meeting that day. What do y'all think my construction manager is going to ask me? Pastor, do you what? Have the money. So I'm driving to the construction meeting. I'm not far from the property. I can see the church being built. And while I'm driving, I'm thinking, what am I going to tell this construction manager? And while I'm thinking about what I need to tell him, my cell phone rings. It's from a pastor who is part of a board of another church called Gateway Church. And this church knew we were under construction. He calls me and says, Pastor Evan, uh, Pastor Robert, just wanted me to call and tell you, we know you're constructing your facility and uh, all the elders got together and we voted on this, but he wants you to know that it's really him wanting to bless word of truth. He says, if you'll give us your banking information, we're going to wire you all $200,000 today. <laughs> Problem solved. And I want you to get perspective. 
All that pressure that I thought I was under, had I had spiritual insight, I'd have already known this problem is going to get fixed. And I'm telling you, New Light, I don't care what problem you have. If you'll stay in faith, God will fix it. I cannot tell you the importance. See, I, I'm not just a giver. I'm a sower. There's a difference. Most of the time you give because you have an obligation. That's why you give your electric company your money because you got to give it to them because if not, they're going to take back their electricity. So most of the time people who give, it's because of an obligation. But when you sow, that's when you understand that, listen, my life is contingent. The success of my life is contingent upon me being able. Listen, I have a car. And on this car, the license plate says, generous. I have one that says, live to give and give to live. See, I've decided that I'm not going to let my job, my occupation, or watch this now, people's liking me or not liking me control God's prosperity in my life. And I haven't always been a pastor. So I'm not telling you this because I'm a pastor. I didn't start pastoring until I was 40. So it's not like I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this because if I was sitting in that seat, it's because I already believe it. So here's what we're going to do right now. I don't know what is in your heart to give. I'm not going to give you an amount. But what I am going to challenge you to do is just take a moment. So right here, even those of you who are watching online, I just want you right there where you are to bow your head and back everybody in the house just bow your head and I really believe everybody in the house and everybody who's watching is supposed to participate you say well why is that Pastor Evan because God would not have you here and he would not have you watching if he didn't want you to watch this activate your faith with what was being said and I want you to just take a moment and ask the Lord Lord what do you, what do you want me to give what do you want me to give? Ask him. And if you hear what he tells you to do, I want you to obey him. Here's why. Because anytime God gives you something to give, if he's specific, that means he's got something else on his mind that you don't know of. And this is why, here it is years later, 17 years has gone by, and I can see the result of my obedience to God from sowing the seed. So if you're there at home, take a minute and do that. Father, thank you for the word that has been sown today. I thank you that it has been sown on good hearts, in good ground. And I pray even some people who've never heard you speak to them before, I pray that you will speak to their mind and their heart about what you want them to give let it be an indelible impression upon them they may not even recognize that it's your voice but they will feel this pressing of this is what i need to do and father there are some people who 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 need to they're in a they're in a financial crunch and they're trying to figure out how they gonna get out just like peter was i pray that today they will not let this moment go by without being obedient to your voice in jesus mighty name can everybody say amen Amen. So here's what I want you to do. If you need an envelope from the ushers, just raise your hand if you need an envelope. And uh, the ushers are going to serve you. If you're watching us, you can give electronically. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop what you're doing right now. And I want you to give electronically if you're at home. Do it right now. A lot of times we say, oh, I do it, I do it, I do it. No, do it right now because I believe your obedience at this moment. Here's the thing. We want God to show up for us. In other words, how many want God to do what he wants, what you want him to do? I do. Well, why don't you do what he wants you to do? Amen. All right, they're still serving those who are here. Hands are up. And then uh, uh, we're going to wait till they get served, and then I'm going to ask everybody to stand up, and we're going to do a confession. Keep your hands up real high, real high so they can see that. And if you're at home, you go ahead, and, and, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to match the seed I gave here 17 years ago. I'm going to give, give 5,000. Yes, 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 yes. I'm going to give 5,000. You know what? It, it, there may be somebody. Listen. If, if, if you, you know, I, 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 I'm different. So, like, 
one word to you is three words to me. So like somebody might right now might be struggling, that's three words, right? And when I was praying earlier, this was last night, the thought came to me, if someone is struggling, if God put $10,000 in your spirit from your business or from you personally, and if, that, if he put that in there and you struggle in, how many words is that? Three. If you struggle in, I'll match you with another 10 if you do that 10. Ooh. So just let me know. You know. I don't know who it is. If you if you here in the house and that's you, just raise your hand and I'll match that 10. If you're online and that's you, uh, we can verify it and all that. I'll, I'll match it, but I'm, I only gonna match one ten. I ain't, you know, only one ten. I just felt that, so I don't. That's you, ma'am. I'm gonna match your ten thousand dollars. Well, let's stand. Hallelujah. Did you receive the word today? Yes. I want you to make this declaration with me. Say, Father, today I'm activating my faith for future problems or current problems by sowing the seed. And so I thank you for activating my harvest ahead of time in Jesus' name. And I thank you. No problem would overtake me. I already have the wisdom, the favor, the resources, the guidance, and the thoughts to solve it in Jesus' mighty name.